The latest uh, breakthrough is a type of treatment called precision medicine. And this is different to chemotherapy, uh, where we actually give a treatment, whether it's a pill or an injected uh, intravenous uh, medicine, uh, that actually switches off the cancer and spares the normal cells. You know, my late father was a doctor who treated many a patient suffering from some type of cancer. 10 million people die every year from some form of cancer. I wish he was alive today to hear what you are about to hear. It's news of a new treatment for lung cancer, one that involves no chemo and one that has already proven to be the most effective treatment yet for this killer disease. The five-year survival rate for people with lung cancer is only around 20%, but that is about to change. Before we speak with Dr. Bob Lee, we want to hear from a patient who had stage four lung cancer and who is now free of that disease. It was my 34th birthday. I had a beautiful little girl who was three years old at the time, and uh, that was in 2014. Um, I was doing my dream job as a lawyer, and you know we were looking to expand our family. And um, the the day before my thirty uh, fourth birthday party, I felt a little lump above my left collarbone. I wasn't quite sure whether I should be concerned about it, but luckily I, I had a family full of doctors and we had a little discussion on, on my birthday um, about what to do with it. I had been coughing a bit at the time, but it was around spring and um, I thought it was just a post viral cough that, that didn't go away for a while. The ultrasound um, led to a biopsy and my dad was the first person who read the report. He uh, read it out to me, the, the three words, primary lung cancer shattered my life from then on. Then it was an agonizing weeks of waiting for the results from the, from the biopsy and the, the fluids. And eventually I found out that I had a um, very rare form of lung cancer that was driven by a um, gene rearrangement of the ROS1 gene. And then came a clinical trial. Um, I was something like the 25th person in the world to take the drug uh, and, and be on this clinical trial. I had to fly down to uh, Melbourne, which is in interstate. Um, with a young family, it was a little bit tricky, but, but it was all worth it. Um, I've been on that drug now for eight years and uh, almost eight years. And I'm, I'm just so grateful because, you know, my, my three-year-old is now um, 11, 12, um, turning 12 next year. And, and um, yeah, I didn't think that I would see her start kindergarten, let alone finish primary school. So to anyone who is thinking about joining a trial or has been um, given a trial as an option to, to your treatment, I think it's so important to um, find out a bit more so you can understand and make no assumptions about what you know about clinical trial. It's given back my life and I never knew that clinical trial could do that, but now I know that clinical trial is testing what is soon to be, hopefully, the state of the art drug. For people like myself who, you know, we're living with cancers that really at the moment has no cure, And now, my conversation with Dr. Bob Lee, a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Doug, for having me here. It's a great, great uh, opportunity and great privilege. You know, uh, I mentioned uh, in the intro here that uh, my dad did a lot of cancer research when he was a, a young doctor in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I remember dinner table conversations. I was a, a small child, so I didn't understand the, the nuances and the details of this sort of thing. But I did remember hearing 
him saying that cancer will never be cured or, or gotten rid of completely because uh, it is a natural process of, of cell division. Uh, has that changed now? And is this breakthrough that we're talking about part and parcel of this change? Absolutely, Doug. Thanks for sharing. Cancer research was difficult back in the day, and, and your dad was certainly a pioneer taking on this, this uh, enemy of mankind. Uh, cancer's certainly had its, has a long history. It's known as the emperor of all maladies. It's got this uh, uh, character that strikes fear among people, and it's also ubiquitous. And as you mentioned, 10 million deaths still uh, uh, exist today ten, uh, every single year uh, worldwide. Uh, and yet, uh, thanks to advances in technology and biological understanding of cancer, we're getting closer to the cure. And we have to define cure as the eradication of cancer as a cause of death and as a cause of suffering. And that, to me, is, is a cure. If, and we all got to die one day of something. And if, if you get cancer and it's not something that's going to take your life and it's not something that's going to going to uh, really uh, significantly uh, devastate your life and, and also the loved ones, uh, that is a cure. It's something that you can manage, that you can live with, and, and perhaps even eradicate once for all, before, uh, and it, ne it never comes back. That is achievable in a lot of patients today, particularly if you catch the cancer early. Uh, and even in the late stages, there's really a lot of hope today. And I have patients, even with stage four disease, who are living five, 10, 15 years out uh, and, and cancer-free on the CT scan. So to, that's pretty close to a cure, even though we don't have a cure for all cancers yet. So you have described this new treatment of the, the people that you're working with at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute in New York as a, a breakthrough, an absolute breakthrough. What makes it so? Yes, the latest uh, breakthrough is a type of treatment called precision medicine. And this is different to chemotherapy, uh, where we actually give a treatment, whether it's a pill or an injected uh, intravenous uh, medicine, uh, that actually switches off the cancer and spares the normal cells. So it switches off and kills the cancer. The tumor shrinks and melts away, and the cancer cells die. And, and yet the normal cells are spared, and so you can live a pr productive, high quality of life so patients can go on uh, to work, to travel, look after their kids, their grandkids, uh, and, and that is a revolutionizing uh, type of treatment for cancer that didn't exist uh, when your, uh, your father was working on cancer research. But today, more and more precision medicines are being made, and one of the uh, latest breakthroughs that is universally recognized around the world is the uh, drugging of KRAS. KRAS is the so-called king of oncogenes, the most commonest mutation uh, in, an, in an, a gene that, that drives cancer growth and cancer spread. And for 40 years, we've not been able to crack it. It's known as undruggable in the scientific community. But after all that effort, and thanks for, to international collaboration in clinical trials, uh, we've got the first FDA approval of a KRAS inhibitor. It's a pill that you take once a day, and it melts away the cancer. And the, this, the trial was started back in 2019, and I had the privilege of leading this international trial. Many of my patients uh, who had incurable metastatic disease from 2019 are still alive and well today, and many of them cancer-free on the scan. We call it no evidence of disease on the CT scan. Mm -hmm. So KRAS, it, it operates at, at the level of DNA to literally change the makeup of a cell's DNA, correct? That's exactly right. Uh, KRAS, otherwise known as KRAS, is a gene uh, that unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately mutates and uh, uh, in cancers, and unfortunately that drives a significant uh, portion of many types of cancers. It's the most commonest uh, oncogene mutation across all human cancers, the most difficult, but now we're seeing that hope uh, turning into reality. Mm -hmm. uh, where are the trials at this stage right now? How many people have taken this medicine and how many people have benefited from it? 
So the trial was uh, uh, started in 2019 as first in human phase one. We quickly went on to the phase two trial, and that was an international trial despite the COVID-19 pandemic where everything was shut down. You know, patients couldn't wait in the waiting room because of the pandemic. We had to reinvent ourselves. We had to ship the drugs to the patients' homes. We had to do telemedicine with Zoom, with WhatsApp, with other devices and, mm. and get blood pressure and, and oxygen saturation devices posted to the patient's home so we could collect those data. And we were still able to do it internationally. Uh, and through, through that innovation and collaboration, we were able to get an accelerated approval by the US FDA uh, from a phase two trial. And now the phase threes uh, in the second or later line setting, which means the tumor had previously been treated with other medicines, that's completed. Uh, and then the first line trial, which is when you've just been diagnosed with lung cancer, that's when, that's when you can hit the cancer hardest. That trial is still being launched at the phase three level. So it's, it's basically In a advanced let me, stage. Let me, inter let me interrupt uh, you. Let me, let me interrupt you because I, I want to understand what a phase three level is, a phase three study. What does that mean? Yeah. Yes, yes. So trials, uh, this is a very important point. Thanks for bringing it up, Doug. Uh, clinical trials are laboriously uh, slow and painstakingly slow. It, it goes from first in human phase one, which looks at safety and tolerability. Phase two it expands to more patients is looking at the efficacy of the drug, whether how well it works. And then phase three is how it works compared to what you already have, say so compared to chemotherapy. The standard of care today is chemotherapy. And then what about this new experimental drug? And that's a, that's a phase three. So from phase one to phase three and, and approval, the traditional time frame is 10 to 15 years for any new drug or new therapy, even new prevention. And we don't have that many 10 to 15 years in our career or in our lifespan. So if we just stick to that status quo, uh, we, we would never secure cancer. So your, your dad was partly right in that sense. Uh, but because of the innovation and collaboration and the technology, uh, we're really seeing glimpses of that promised land of the cure for cancer. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it in, in my own patients. And we saw the development of KRAS inhibitors in less than three years from first in human dosing, phase one, to FDA approval up to phase three in less than three years. So, and if this becomes there, the norm rather than the exception, we're going to see the cure. And our, uh, we know that this is devoted to lung cancer treatment. There are different kinds of lung cancer. What lung cancer does this address? And does it have applications beyond lung cancer to other forms of cancer? Yes, this is a very important question. This is the, may, one of the hottest questions, Doug, in the scientific community. This is so-called the um, tumor agnostic uh, precision medicine or basket trials. So rather than treating each cancer differently, if you pin down the, the molecular drivers, in this case KRAS, you could use a lung cancer therapy to treat a bowel cancer. So KRAS inhibitors are now being developed for advanced stage bowel cancers that are also driven by KRAS and also pancreatic cancers. And now we've, we're seeing efficacy uh, from these trials, very, very promising results just published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that my institution, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center or MSK uh, had the opportunity Hi. of leading. So mm -hmm. this is, yeah, this is just so many cancers that we can, we can impact and we shouldn't be just siloed and, and, and stuck on just one type of cancer. It should really benefit patients uh, from all, all types of tumors and people from all walks of life and people all around the world. Would that, would that also include such uh, cancers as breast cancer, prostate cancer? Yes, so if you look at a different molecule, for example, HER2, uh, we spell that H-E-R-2 in capital letters and, and the two in uh, the number two. HER2 is a uh, driver in about 20% of breast cancers. And the so-called Herceptin revolution, which is a drug called trastuzumab, about 20 years ago, had really changed the lives of women with metastatic uh, and early stage HER2 positive breast cancer. But since then, we've translated that to gastric cancers, uh, to colorectal cancers, 
and more recently to lung cancers using the same type of precision medicine. There are some subtle differences, but through innovation and collaboration, we're able to derive benefit for more patients across multiple types of cancers. So breast cancer uh, is different to lung, but there are commonalities that we can, we, in, in molecular drivers that we can target. Uh, how long before this becomes widely available uh, to uh, populations across the world, or at least the country? So if we take uh, KRAS inhibitor, the sotorasib uh, drug, for, for example, which uh, I had the, uh, the privilege of uh, developing clinically, uh, it's now, it was first approved in the uh, United States uh, by the FDA in 2021. Uh, through an accelerated approval mechanism. So that became uh, widely available in the United States. But now through international collaboration between government regulatory agencies, and one of them called Project Orbis, which got eight different countries to work together, and many other forms of collaboration, we, we're now seeing this approved in more than 40 countries. So potentially available uh, to a lot more people. But what more needs to be done to expand access to those medicines for patients in need. Another hurdle is this, just the testing. We, if we don't test the tumor for KRAS, you're not gonna get a uh, KRAS inhibitor. And more testing needs to be done across board and access needs to, ex to be expanded. And like I had mentioned, the 10 to 15 year time frame shorten to just two to three years. Make that a norm rather than the exception. And more investment yeah. will be done uh, poured into this field, and we're going to rapidly accelerate this in this lifetime. You know, what, the one thing that people who have been diagnosed with cancer, which is obviously devastating news for anybody, is, is to have hope, is to have real hope. How can people keep abreast of, of the developments of this new treatment? So we started the Cure for Cancer public awareness campaign just to initial, uh, to launch this initial awareness and to to let the public know, let people know what a clinical trial is. So we need to raise awareness, spread the word that there is hope through clinical trials, that you can develop therapies of not just today, but tomorrow for patients who are suffering today. And uh, the C4C is, a, is really an international movement. We encourage uh, patients uh, and family members and physicians from all walks of life to just tell their story and, and share their story about the clinical trial. And that will spread the message uh, across board, uh, across all stakeholders. And, and Doug, you're playing a leading role here, spreading the word uh, to, to people in need all around the world. And I think the more we do that, the more institutions and government agencies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical industries, um, the patient advocacy group foundations, they, they're all gonna play a role then we're gonna really create uh, a global movement to cure cancer. And I believe if we do that, we can cure it in this lifetime, not the next one. Dr. Bob Lee, this is incredibly uh, encouraging information and thank you so much for taking some time to bring it to us. We really appreciate that. Dr. Bob Lee, Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute. Thank you, sir.